Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Sight to be with you. Oh my days, today is going to be a what we would call hot one in the business. Um, I'm very excited, joined by a very another special, special guest. Um, so this is episode, I think, six at this point, so I don't understand how we've reached this many, but here we are. Um, so I'll pass it over to you, my special guest, if you could please tell us who you are, what you do, and when you're, doing, when you're not doing that. Hi, uh, really nice to, to be here, uh, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so my name is Dr. Linda Kay, and I am a reader in psychology at Edgehill University. Um, and if for those people who don't know what a reader is, um, who might be international <laughs> audiences or even in the UK, um, it's basically somewhere between being a lecturer and a professor. So research leadership. Um, and I uh, do a lot of stuff in cyber psychology, psychology, digital gaming and online behavior. And what do I do when I'm not doing that? Um, I sing, I walk, I sunbathe and watch films. <laughs> That's a very, very short version of that, but I will elaborate on any of those things um, in due course. <laughs> Lovely stuff. So yeah, um, full disclosure, you might be wondering how I managed to snag a guest this big. Well, that is because uh, I you know, I am one of uh, Linda's tu tutorees, PhDs, whatever, what, any of those. Linda is like my director of studies, my big, the big cheese supervisor, if you will. Um, which is obviously a great honor and a privilege to be working with someone as fantastic. Um, but you know, that helped me get a bit of leverage to get Linda on the show. So it all, it all works, right? Bit of nepotism never hit anyone. Uh, <laughs> so just to kick off then with the, so just to break that down a little bit more, there's like, you know, the class, the class system, the level system, there's lecturer, reader, then professor. That's how, how does that tier system work? That is a very good question. And, I have, I have uh, no idea, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. And to be honest, it's, it's, you've got these different terms in different places in, in the world, and usually the UK system is um, having an academic job, which where you're doing research and teaching, you'd be typically employed as a lecturer or a senior lecturer, depending what you know how much experience you've had. Um, and then typically in the UK, before you get to sort of full-blown professor where you're kind of internationally recognised for your research, where you've got X amount of research funding, et cetera, et cetera, that you, you kind of are usually apply for. Um, in between that, you've got kind of readership, which sometimes is called things like associate professor, I think, at other places. The trouble is when you then look at the U US, they use the term professor to refer to when you're a le lecturer. So that makes it extra confusing when explaining this to international audiences. So yeah, reader basically is I do the same as when I was a senior lecturer, but just have a little bit more responsibility in research leadership. So basically do a bit more in doing things like staff development, capacity building, all those kind of things, which I really enjoy doing. So yeah, that's basically what, what I'm kind of paid to do. <laughs> okay that that makes sense i can see that so how how does one then you mentioned like there's a few like different metrics in achieving professorship is that something that a, you're interested in firstly um i think so i kind of want, have always kind of wanted to go up in a kind of academic route and that is the next sort of obvious place to go there, there isn't really anywhere else to go unless i kind of moved out of academia you know the the other sort of option is you know just going off and doing you know consultancy or, or whatever but you know if i was staying in academia then yeah that would be the next obvious step you know maybe a few years down the line before i start applying to that because uh yeah you, you kind of need to have had enough experience to to demonstrate that you've you, you've brought in lots of money to your university and that you you're internationally recognized and you know all that kind of stuff so this will be a way to go yet before i get there <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest and if you've listened to this show before you'll know why this will gripe me but why 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 does it have to do with how much money you've brought in like what why capitalism why have we chosen this route <laughs> Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to know the same, but basically that's that's the way a university operates, and particularly in the UK, most of the um, university's funds come from student uh, fees, um, which, you know, largely is actually paid by the government because most people, you know, get the student loans, so the university has to make money somehow, um, and that's basically how to do it, by bringing in research income or doing knowledge exchange where you might be, you know, consulting uh, broader, so... That's the way it works, unfortunately. Um, and getting money is very difficult as part of the reason I've not actually been very successful on that so far. 
Fair enough. So, would you be able to tell us a bit more about what you've been up to, like, recently? We, we know, we've got, like, another thing we are going to talk about as a separate thing, so let's just focus on, like, uh, what, what you've been up to academically or research-wise at the moment. Yeah, so um, I've been involved in quite a lot. You know, my research has gone, I suppose, quite a bit broader than it always used to. My, my research traditionally had been on the psychology of digital gaming and... I suppose the underpinning thing I've always been interested in in gaming is the sort of social thing of that. So what do we mean by social when we're thinking about gaming? Um, and so my early research was very much looking at what we might class typically as social gaming, something like, you know, playing cooperatively or competitive with somebody in that time, in that context, and what do you experience in that moment? So I did you know several studies from that kind of perspective and then started broadening out really on on this question about what do we mean by social and this is where I started looking at these sort of broader conceptualizations of being social so that's where things like social identity really started to come in you know how you define yourself based on the people that you were connected with and this sort of social glue that kind of operates on a sort of psychological level so you don't have to be in the same room with this, those people to be socially connected so I did loads of research looking at kind of how that works for different gaming communities and how that's important things like well-being inclusion that kind of thing um, and I suppose there's kind of that question about being social is something I've still continued to be interested in and um, it's something I'm looking more at now in terms of things like social media behaviors and how do we understand what social is um, when we're you know interacting with other people on social media the levels of that and um, again looking at how that might be important to think about things like inclusion and feeling connected because I suppose the main overarching thing I'm interested in in my research is thinking well why is this important societally you know we know that the need for human connection is a fundamental human need um, and if we can understand how that operates online and what that intersection is in terms of our real world and inverted commas um, environments and context, then it's a really important thing to understand. So we're not looking at our technology behaviours as being something that's disconnecting us from the real world, um, but actually a part of that. Um, so a lot of the research I've, I've continued to do and have been doing recently has been kind of asking that question, I guess, in many different ways. Um, but that's the essence of kind of what I'm interested in, I guess. It's very much uh, going against the grain, I suppose. In the, the, I mean, you know, again, if you've listened to this before, we've discussed quite a lot the moral panic of video game studies and why that's a faff. Uh, you know, social media again. They're trying to, you're trying to get. <laughs> funding for research and things like well what if this isn't all bad and everyone's like no but it's obviously bad because social media finger quotes you know um, <laughs> yeah so yeah i can see why that might be challenging um that overlaps with like with gaming quite well i think you know in i think very much re reinforced during the pandemic uh like who wasn't playing animal crossings let's be honest uh <laughs> well yeah without a doubt and it was really interesting seeing the kind of very quick shift because I did, I did engage in quite a lot of like media interviews and journalists and stuff and it was really interesting how very quickly I was then being asked questions about oh in what ways is gaming of keeping us connected to others it's like well it always has been actually <laughs> interesting you should ask that it's, um, it's and like the, um, the, the, that the... meme with the astronauts <laughs> it's like <laughs> has games been, are video games connecting us no always have <laughs> always have um so it was I mean it was kind of refreshing it was nice to see that and think oh well, finally but you know you, that was just obviously quite specific at that point to a particular time and context and I think you know it may have kind of there might be some longevity in, in in those messages but I think you know it has probably very quickly switched back again um you know which is fair enough because, you know, it, it is useful to think about, you know, public debate and obviously the media have a, a big role in that. And yeah, there are harms associated with things like social media and gaming. I'm not, you know, my research never precludes that that's an issue, but I think it's the balance of it, which is, you know, proportionately, you know, it's, it's important to make sure it's a balanced kind of perspective and broadcast. And so it's, yeah, it was, it was interesting when that, that happened. Yeah. But yeah, right. it's, it's very much the case that I think my research has always felt very, like I'm a sw salmon swimming upstream, um, has always felt very much against where the mainstream rhetoric is. And 
you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of a challenge. That's fine. But um, it's it, it does get, it is quite difficult. And you do find yourself trying to find creative ways of trying to, you know, break the mold a little bit and, and find effective ways of trying to break that kind of stereotype or that, you know, that, that main message. So, you know, it's, I think what, what I think what what's been helpful on that is actually going back to the kind of core psychology and this is where things like social identity theory is great because it's it holds water um any anytime you apply it for something it holds a lot of water and it's it's solid it's robust so um it you can then apply that and think well we know this applies to other things like you know community groups or whatever it might be so why shouldn't it also apply to gaming groups or to you know whatever so you know that's where you can start to kind of pick away a little bit at that at that kind of um mainstream message and say well actually you know we we've, there's something quite interesting and positive here i mean you you pick on a few really important points there i think especially around like you have to acknowledge that for, for some people and uh, we, we don't know why because correlation doesn't equal causation but like video mm. games can be maladaptive in the same way that anything can be cheese can mm. be maladaptive for some people you know um and it's it, there's definitely like people perceive any argument against that kind of well social media isn't that bad for you or video games aren't bad for you as a complete denial of like any kind of like it like a, oh you're a social media denier i think is a phrase i saw in a hashtag you know and it's like no, no, we're just trying to bring genuine empirical, you know, kind of actual scientific study and data to to examine this further. Because, you know, there's that kind of philosophy. It, I mean, is it self-fulfilling prophecy? But, like, you know, if you're looking for something, you will, you will find it because you will make it. So. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you, you see that all the time. And, you know, that, that obviously doesn't help kind of, public debate if you know people are cherry picking and you know and, and and having that bias but yeah I mean I think part of the problem um I suppose I've observed this with whether it's gaming or social media or smartphones or whatever whatever technology happens to be the reference point to be honest um is it's often talked about in very sort of dichotomous and polarized terms it's like are games bad is social media bad it's like well Yes and no, <laughs> you know what? It, it can be concurrently both at the same time. Actually, for for any given person, actually, so that's not really very helpful when you kind of have such a broad reference point. Um, so what I've started to write about, and um, in my my forthcoming book, a very shameless plug, um, is um, about this idea of looking at kind of a framework that looks at what, why, and how. You know what you're engaging in, how you're engaging, and why you're engaging. You know if you break down the question into those sort of components then you can actually have different sort of offshoots of what might be harmful and what might not be and you have different kind of combinations of all these things so um yeah by asking the question are, is, are video games bad yes they are and no they're not <laughs> it depends on what kind of games you're referring to who's playing them how they're playing them why they're playing them all these kind of things so yeah it's um that's part of the problem i think is that there's a very unnuanced um perception of what social media is social media is massive even different platforms themselves within that different things you can do in those different platforms you know it's it's too broad a category basically have you have you found in like because i mean one of the the big things that is kind of the intersection i think of all of those particularly around social identity and uh relationships and parasocial relationships is twitch because that is is a very community driven it's very you know it's, it's monetized which adds that adds questions to be asked as well as like you know it's not by and large video game centric but generally you know i'd say the majority is like video game centric so it, that kind of like is a really have you thought about looking at twitch research and, and gaming communities because that's something that you can foster a sense of community without playing the game specifically it's true. It's not something I've looked at specifically, but um, I'm aware of literature on that. And a lot of it is about, you know, spectatorship and what people get out of that and, you know, the, the reasons people do that. But it is interesting in terms of the kind of, uh, it, actually, it comes back to the question about is is that social gaming? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I, I would argue yes, because you, you're kind of connected via some kind of social engagement. And I suppose I've kind of thought when I've sort of reviewed them, um, wrote a review re recently on you know social gaming and what it means and i think spectatorship i think from what i remember writing about it kind of came into that and and was classed as as that kind of um 
there is a necessary a kind of interdependence between people, but that shouldn't be the only thing that is used to define what social is. It's kind of on the lower end of that, but still is kind of social. But yeah, definitely, I think would very much come under um, kind of community and things. So it, it's something that's very interesting. It's not something I've done, but um, I do have an, an incoming PhD student who is going to be looking more at some things related to that. So. So if you, if you uh, want to look at Twitch specifically, you know, hit, hit Linda up. Let's get a PhD application in. You come join the team, you know. Um, well, I've, she's, she's already going to be starting. <laughs> she's already appointed. Yeah, but well, yes, let's, if there's other things you want to do, more let's, let's get more. Let's get a whole team. It, it does need a whole team. <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned your book. We'll get onto that in a moment. I've got a couple of, like, other sort of smaller questions to lead up there. But the, the first yeah, big um, one is... Are there any other like pieces of your work that you'd like to give mention to sort of like specifically just to sort of to tell people about while you have this platform? Oh, thank you. That's a very kind opportunity. Um, I suppose two main things really. Um, one is I suppose I I don't actually do that much stuff on digital gaming now. Actually, I, I've sort of broadened out to other things. And part of the reason for that is I've just got great people who are doing their PhDs who are doing that stuff. <laughs> uh, yourself included in that, which hey. is really nice. <laughs> and it's it's I was kind of reflecting on this and I think I put something on Twitter on um, before the weekend on this and it's it made me feel really grateful actually that I'm kind of in a position to be able to do that not only because I've had the security in my job to be able to get to the stage of my career that I'm at but just to have to know that the people I'm handing the baton over to are you know of, of good people who do good research who are very good researchers and who'll do the research justice. So, um, yeah, I'm very grateful um, to, to have yourself and, and other people doing research that is aligned to my interests, which means that I can go off and flit around and do other things, um, which is always always nice. Um, but, yeah, also, so obviously the, the research you're doing and, and, and Beth will be doing are obviously around the sort of psychology of digital gaming um, and doing some great stuff around that, obviously around, you know, the way that digital games can be you know, pro-social in terms of, you know, receptivity of mental health things, which obviously is very important. That's me. But that's the other that's research, my research. That's you, what I'm that's doing. That's you. That's you. They'll fund anything yeah. these well, days. You can, you can talk more about it than I can. You, you, you know, you're the expert on it. Uh, I mean, mm. expert is a strong word. <laughs> I know. It's, uh, you, you own it. You own it. It's your intellectual property. Um, so, yeah, so there's that stuff, which is great. And it's nice to be able to be in a kind of mentorship position to be able to um, support that kind of research, um, which is really, really kind of important. Um, but the other research I'm doing is um, kind of looking at emoji. So whereas a lot of my research, the underpinning thing is looking at this, what, what is social? Um, I suppose I've kind of branched out a little bit and now asking that question, what is emotional? <laughs> I, just, I just keep coming back to the kind of core questions in psychology. Um, and, you know, the, the research we're doing there um, is really just asking that question, are emoji emotional? And you might be thinking, well, duh, yeah, obviously. Um, but, you know, there's, there's actually not that much research that actually really answers that question. And uh, the reason we started asking that question is we were kind of asked these things. We did some public engagement events, sort of psychology in the pub sort of series, presenting some of the stuff we'd done on emoji previously. And, we, you know, the general public were kind of asking these sorts of questions and made me think, oh, I'll have a look. I'll see what the literature's shown. That. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, there was very that, little there. That sounds amazing. Psychology in the pub can wear. Let's. It, that, it's that just sounds fantastic. Awesome. That's a BPS thing, actually. They um, it tends to be the branches that organise psychology in the pub. Um, there are all other sort of public engagement schemes like Cybar, similar to game, really. Um, science in bars, it's great. <laughs> What's not to love? But yeah, public engagement is really fun, actually. It's um, the first time I did it. I was it was quite. I don't tend to get nervous when I'm public speaking, but yeah, it was sort of different. You know, you you feel like you're a bit out in the wild and you're not safely in a lecture theatre, but it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And the, the best thing I've learned from doing public engagement is leave time for to have a dialogue because the general public will ask really sensible questions and they actually ask the questions we are now answering in our research and we would never have thought about such an obvious question to ask <laughs> um, in, if we were looking at it academically so um, I, I'd always encourage people researchers to get involved in doing public engagement it is a lot of fun um, 
and they say science in a pub what's not to like <laughs> yeah sorry you were you were talking about um, your emoji work there yeah so that's that's what kind of motivated that really from doing that public engagement and just really what we're we're asking the question is using these many, you know, um, well, well-oiled methods from sort of more cognitive psychology and, you know, decision making, let's call decision tasks and so on is understanding, you know, do, do people actually automatically process them um, as emotional stimuli? Um, so do we see a kind of what we call a processing advantage um, like we do with emotional words compared to non-emotional words, for example? We know that is an effect that happens in psychology. So do we see the same effect for emoji? And we're finding actually, uh, no, not really. <laughs> we, I mean, we, I, we don't think they actually are necessarily processed fully, you know, at an automatic level um, in that way. But I mean, there's still kind of early days. You know, we've got some interesting things coming up. Um, so yeah it's that's exciting to again and obviously like i i don't work for the platform and i've, I've been very critical of twitch generally um as, a, as an aside but it, it's again interesting to think about uh emojis or emotes as they're sort of called on the platform because you're know, like on my channel i have my own emotes one's a freaking banana you know one's like it's a, a 3d model of my face you know like with the word hype underneath it like so so even within you have like what are emotes and general things like hype and like hearts and stuff that people can attach symbolic meaning to but even cross like within a single stream there can be emotes completely unique to that streamer and community and that's a heck of a lot of diversity to try and research yeah and this is the thing which um we're, we're always very mindful of is we, we're looking at very specific types of emoji like these very sort of basic facial ones so we're not ever generalizing across all types of emoji but you know again you see sort of things in the media or what's you know um you know talking about emoji in very basic terms like why do people use emoji it's like well depends what kind <laughs> in what context with whom um so yeah it's um again it, it always comes back i find i always come back to this issue is that the thing the reference point in the research is very broad um when we look at technologies and you know part of the kind of challenge of doing this research is really narrowing down what the reference point is that that's that's important but then at the same time that's risky um because you know several years ago people might have been doing research on um I'm trying to think now of a, a platform that's shut down. Um, oh, the, be, be, was it Bebo? Bebo, yeah. I think that made a comeback recently, actually. I can't remember. What's that what it's called? I don't know. I can't remember. Bebo, yeah, it was it that. I can't remember. It just that sounded wrong when I said it in my head. But yeah, I mean, you could have been doing research on that and then it closes down and then you're halfway through a PhD. <laughs> you're screwed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult getting the balance there, you know, when technologies might be a bit, um, you know, not necessarily stable. Um, mm. You don't know, do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I feel I feel obliged to ask, what is your favourite emoji if you have one? Yeah, I'm the crying with laughter one. Definitely, that's definitely one I probably use the most because um, I, I often share silly things, particularly through WhatsApp. Um, that's probably the one my favourite one because I think I suppose I, the connotations are associated with just things that are daft or funny. Um, I wouldn't necessarily tend to use um, other types of emoji because I wouldn't necessarily be sharing a lot of sad news, maybe. But yeah, I tend to use emoji most in, in WhatsApp, um, a little bit on Twitter, but actually very little anywhere else. And a lot of it is to do with the form um, because, you know, and things like, you know, if, it, if it's my, on my smartphone with a keyboard, that's a lot easier, but i don't often use them that much on twitter because you have to sort of find it on the yeah it's a bit it's a bit more difficult so mm. yeah i have to say i think mine is like it's like the the person like questioning like the sort of hands like flat out to the side like a wow well, i don't know kind of uh, well, i don't know yeah. <laughs> yeah that's when i use that one like <laughs> yeah that one's a good one i like that one. I feel I feel obliged to ask and you, i suppose you don't have to answer and i don't want to make the conversation more blue but is there like any research being done on like the context of emojis? Because I remember the day I found out that veg fruits and vegetables were used for not not shopping lists, shall we say? <laughs> and I was quite like shocked by this. And like an aubergine can have all sorts of contexts. And I was like, I was genuinely shocked by this, and I felt very old when this happened. Well, yeah, there is bits of research on context. Interesting, I, I shared this on Twitter the other day. Somebody had posted about the heart emoji and the different colours. And I was like, have I been using these wrong all the time? I was really surprised. 
So different, even different types of red hearts, you can be used in different ways. And I was like, oh dear, uh, that's. Not, I mean, I tend to just use red hearts rather than any other colour. But yeah, anyway, that was interesting. But, but, but why, why, <laughs> what, why would they be different? What would that mean? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of it's to do with the sentiment that you, um, you know, associating. But yeah, that was that was quite enlightening. I, I just yeah, use there purple because is... I like purple. Yeah, what's wrong with that? I can't remember what that one was. But yeah, I remember the yellow was something like if you kind of upbeat and, and things like that. And uh, blue was, you know, tends to be bros who use it in, you know, group chats and things like that. So I was like, oh, really? You, you heard it here first. Um, use, if, you're, if you're in your group chat with your boys or your lasses, <laughs> use blue hearts because that's that's what that means. <laughs> that's the thing to do, apparently. But yeah, anyway, so that, that, that was news, news to me. Um. But yeah, there is research that looks at kind of context. Um, in, it looks at it in different ways. So some looks at it in, in very specific contexts and controls that in the studies. So um, how emoji are appraised in relation to food items, for example. Um, so how you associate sentiment with um, commercial products. So obviously that kind of stuff's useful for things like advertising and so on. Um, other research does look at kind of etiquette and that kind of stuff um off the top of my head I, i'm not sure specifically on the kind of the, the sexual kind of connotations and things but yeah definitely people are kind of uh, looking at these sorts of things it's uh, the context is, is key really you know i'm you know social psychologist basically so i always look at things in a social context to understand these things so that that leads in quite nicely to because uh, i remember a contextual example from your uh, mm. tedx talk on emojis firstly oh, yeah. what was that like as an experience because i'm not gonna lie it looked pretty dope as a viewer <laughs> uh, can you talk a little bit about that for us yes absolutely um it was such a good experience um it was probably one of the sort of highlights of my life really um, uh, a link a sort of link to that will easy. be attached to the description wherever you found this just, just excellent <laughs> Thank you. Good plug. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, probably one of the highlights of my life, really. And, you know, you know I always said it would be nice to be able to do a TED talk or a TEDx talk. And you know, I just got invited to do it. I don't know who had nominated me or how, or how I was sort of um, identified to do one. But either way, it was it was a lot of fun. And the one thing that was nice, actually, is um, you're in there with a kind of a group of other people doing all their talks. And you, you do feel like a bit of a family, really. And Every, um, you're kind of there talking about a theme. So ours was to do with technology and um, I can't remember the specific name of the theme now, but um, everybody was doing something that was sort of technologically kind of related um, for many different disciplines, you know, physics, bio, whatever, psychology, politics. Um, but there was this kind of commonality that kind of brought everybody together, even though people were sort of talking about very, very different things. And it was a really cool experience and you properly get you know hosted and you know have nice dinner and you have to get put up in this nice hotel and we were in Vienna which is just like amazing and in this beautiful theatre which is just beautiful and um, I didn't manage to see as much of Vienna as I would have liked to unfortunately but it was it was a wonderful experience and I was just very excited about it so I don't tend to get very nervous about public speaking it, for me it was more excitement and adrenaline and um, you know anticipation than nerves really but because you rehearse it so much um, and you have a lot of coaching when you're doing a TED talk um, and they really slow you down when you're talking. So when you get on the stage and that energy is there, you actually then talk at a normal pace, not like, you know, 100 miles an hour, which is normally the pace I would talk at if I was that excited. So it's it's a really good experience. I absolutely loved it. I mean, as someone that speaks with great freneticism at times, I can I can uh, empathise with that. Um, so the the talk was on emojis, and again, I, I should have watched this in advance of the interview. That's me being a bad host. <laughs> Sorry, don't worry. Um, but the example that I think got a a great laugh from the crowd, but was also like a bit of an aha moment, was talking about the use of the wink emoji, and it was like an exchange. Of, it was a screenshot of a WhatsApp message, and it was like, "Oh, did you enjoy watching the film last night?" And you were like, yep, yeah. so in of itself, text is text, the words have meaning, we understand that, we process it. You throw a winky emoji in there, well, that suddenly we're telling a different story, right? Is that correct? Um, yes, that's right. That, that is the, the context. Well done, well remembered. Uh, yeah, so I, I suppose it was sort of alluding to the kind of Netflix and chill thing. And um, I actually had to explain it to one of my colleagues um, before I did a kind of rehearsal with my colleagues in, in a lecture theatre sort of shortly before I 
you know, a few days before the talk. And I, I actually had to explain it to one of my colleagues, which was a bit embarrassing. I just told him to Google Netflix and chill, you know, maybe <laughs> incognito. Um, but um, <laughs> yes, <yeah>, so <laughs> I don't do it on the university Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, it was, um, but yeah, that, that was nice that he kind of got that recognition and, and a laugh and... Yeah, it's, it's exactly that issue about context and how emoji can enhance and sometimes soften, sometimes, you know, completely create a new meaning. And, you know, there's there's, there's examples, and I, I talk about this in some of my um, cyber psychology modules about the idea of digital identity and all this kind of stuff is, you know, you can, uh, emoji have been used in like criminal proceedings, you know, as evidence of intent to harm another person. You know, you know if you've got like a, well, they don't have the revolver emoji anymore, but, you know, with, you know, thumping symbols and an ambulance and that might be directed to a person, you know, those kind of things have been used in criminal proceedings. So, you know, just be careful in your emoji use. <laughs> so it could be used as intent um, behaviour. Always, always bears uh, thinking about. Um, so my next sort of question, so pardon the build up instead of this one, but you are one of the most active, I don't want to use the term busy because there's implications that, but you're one of the most active people I know. You talked about doing press stuff and that you like doing that and, you know, science in a pub. You um, are the current chair of the cyber psychology section, yeah, that's in the VPS, yeah. Um, obviously, you're a reader, psychology, you do stuff like this. Like, you know, how how is sort of, how's all that, like, combined? Like, what's the BPS work like? Yes, so... Um, the BPS stuff is is really interesting to be involved in because it kind of brings everything together actually in many ways. And I've, I've actually have been reflecting on this only only the last few days because I'm actually doing a, a talk for the student section. Um, they're doing like a talks and thoughts thing about people's careers in, in psychology. And it was a nice opportunity to kind of think about things and how it all comes together. Um, but actually what the, the sort of cyber psychology section stuff is, is is just building a capacity really um, about bringing expertise together in cyber psychology. Um, a lot of it has been, you know, because we are a new section, you know, I was, I was one of four people who actually developed the section in the first place. Um, and it's only been the section since 2018. Um, so, you know, a lot of it has just been building capacity actually at this point. And what's really nice to see is it's the section itself is getting recognition. It's valued in the BPS. You know, we're bringing people together. We're doing lots of stuff. Um, and it it's helping the kind of reputation of psych cyber psychology, actually, because it's now, you see it becoming more and more recognised as a, a thing, you know, drawing attention to, you know, why this is important. And that's all important when you think about the fact that so many of these issues um, are so public facing. You know, so much of cyber psychology research is about raising public awareness, informing public debate, informing policy, practitioners, all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, having that kind of reputation and good quality research, good researchers, people who work in industry who are doing good stuff in this is is paramount really to to the kind of why it's important in its role. And I'm always a very big advocate advocate for that. And you know, I do a lot of that kind of sort of stuff as well. But definitely it needs a capacity of people to do that because it's, you know, it's it's not going to go away. You know, these issues about the role of technology in society are only going to continue um, over time. And, you know, having lots of people who are doing this stuff, who can communicate this stuff, you know, you just you need a team of people to, to make change, really. Um, so it's, it's all very interesting. It's all very exciting. So if for listeners' benefit, if you haven't sort of gathered already, you know, I feel, I feel again, it'd be of interest to ask because I, I don't want to use the term celebrity because that's very socially sort of loaded. But you are someone with with status, with gravitas. You're known in your field. You're, you know, the you founding member of the cyber psychology section in the British Psychological Society. You've done these TEDx talks. You've got a sizable Twitter following. You know, I was like, and and just, again, for listeners for context, within the academic sphere, that is not that well heard though. How how do you how do you manage that? What do, what does that feel like? It's, it's always nice to know that the hard work you've put in is is always you know is is appreciated by by the community and maybe wider. So you know it's always nice to feel some kind of reward and some benefit to, to the kind of work you put in. So I think that's why the, the sort of cyber psychology section stuff has been rewarding because it's like I can see that it's made making a difference, and you know it's it's just nice just to to kind of be 
recognize, I suppose, in that way. So thank you for mentioning those things. It's always it's always nice. <laughs> it, it's just you know it's it's in again because not every academic kind of is interested in that or like is like you know no, digital platform. And that's fine. And, yeah, and that that's fine. But it's just interesting to work with someone who has this kind of. I'm, again, like I'm trying to think of good words to describe, like an elevated position. Like you have, you have some gravitas, right? There's no, there's no sort of denying that. Yeah, it's very helpful, I find, and I, I know it has had benefits for opportunities that have come my way, um, and actually, then a knock-on impact of that is then creating opportunities for other people, which is, you know, obviously important. I don't want to just, you know, take all the credit all the time. So. It does help, you know, particularly Twitter, I found has been really beneficial for, you know, helping raise profile and be visible. Um, and that's important because, you know, that's often the kind of place where people become connected. So I often get requests via things like the, the direct messages from journalists and so on because they've seen me on Twitter um, or so on and so forth. So it's it's kind of a vehicle, really, to sort of support that. So, yeah, I think... You know, without Twitter, I don't think they would have had the same vehicle to be able to kind of have all those opportunities. So, yeah, I definitely see the the benefits of it. Um, Sorry, my my brain is kind of going a few miles an hour here. But like the the next little question is, where what's the origin of like Cyber Doctor? That's kind of like your like show name, I guess. <laughs> like... Well, yeah, it's well, it's my, my consultancy name. That's I have I have my uh, private consultancy, and that's the that's trademarked. That's that's my my kind of brand, I guess. Um, that came Linda's because it kind of self dis it's self descriptive. You know, <laughs> I'm a doctor and. I look at cyber psychology, so it kind of made sense. Um, the thing, I think that that was kind of a bit of a backlash against using the term cyber psychologist, which I'm always a bit mindful and wary about that. I would never describe myself as a cyber psychologist because the term ist in, it sort of implies it's a kind of protected, recognised title, which it isn't. You know, they you know, don't have a health um, council professional protected title of being a cyber psychologist like you would with a forensic psychologist or a clinical psychologist or a health psychologist etc so i'd always describe myself as a cyber psychology researcher or academic or something along this, those lines. this actually cracks open a, a bit of a wider nut because there's yeah. a bit of debate around like you know do do you use the term psychologist like you know because i know in particularly overseas in, in the u.s like you have to be registered and that can be changed state by state to call yourself even a psychologist. There's people that argue that, like, well, you know, you've got a degree in psychology, so you are a psychologist. It's just what you're doing is maybe varied. I always say I'm a person that does the psychology, <laughs> you know, because um, protect for those for you know, for listeners' benefit, protected titles mean that you cannot call yourself like a forensic psychologist or a health psychologist without being registered with a certain body. I've spoken before about the importance for regulation, the fact that unfortunately you can go to these places online and become through moral entrepreneuring, circa Dr. Kelly Dunlap, um, like, you know, you can get qualified in anything. You can get a, you know, a, a certificate in elevator music. Well, that doesn't, you know, but like who, I, I could write that on the back of a cereal box and send it to you. It doesn't necessarily pertain to anything. It's not held by any guidelines or it's not reviewed. Um, How do you kind of feel about that, that wider kind of issue around recognition of, psychology and psychology professionals yeah i mean i think i think it's really important to to make that distinction and although i'm talking in terms of the uk context with the british psychological society you are allowed to call yourself a psychologist if you have got a, a doctorate so i could call myself an academic psychologist i personally prefer not to because i see a psychologist as somebody who has gone through a, a a health council and has got that training to be a, a practice practicing or you know professional route in that way um and i think you know it, that that feeds into something important about public perceptions um because i, I the general public generally you know without sounding you know harsh but people often don't understand what psychologists do and what psychology is a lot of the time and i don't think you know calling yourself a psychologist who doesn't actually you know, help people in a clinic, for example. And um, you know, I think it causes more confusion than it than anything really. So, yeah, I'm, I I very rarely, ref well, I don't think I've ever come across an, an instance where I have actually referred to myself as a psychologist or an academic psychologist. I just call myself an academic. 
um, or a cyber psychology researcher or whatever. It depends what context I'm in, but very rarely. And, and often if people are asking what I want to be referred to in things like, you know, news articles or the media things, you know, I'll, I'll always try and make sure that's clear. Sometimes people just write the wrong title and you can't do anything about it. But um, yeah, and I'm always quite wary of using that term, to be honest. But people are allowed to, though. Um, and I'm not, you know, it's their choice whether they want to or not. But it's And, and this is this is like a buzzword for, like I say this a lot, but it's a language issue. Because I mean, if I was going to be cheeky, I'd say, well, people could take take cyber doctor to mean that you're someone that fixes computers you know <laughs> because lang lang language is language yeah, yeah, is yeah. dumb right yeah if we had a dm be like can you fix me in for a pc repair you know, <laughs> you know? Like, i've never actually had that interestingly uh, yeah but it because lang <laughs> because point. language is dumb and restrictive and english is bad like <laughs> you know yeah 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 um, i've never thought of that before actually but yeah i've never had one of those requests actually but um yeah if I do get one of those, I'll know where that's come from now. <laughs> um, so to dial back just a little bit, and, and you know, yeah, obviously yeah. you don't have to, we've talked about the TEDx talk, but have you had another, no, I'm going to say favourite because that's unfair, but maybe most memorable um, public appearance or, or thing, interview that you've had, like even if you've been like, I don't know, interviewing someone else yourself maybe? Um... Like, mo most, um, uh, most, most sort of significant... Oh, that's a science word again, another poor choice. Um, but like, a, you know, one of your uh, most fondly thought of uh, PR interactions. How about that? There we go. Well, I've been really lucky to have quite a lot of nice interactions actually with people. But I think one of the, it's probably because there's a recency effect of being able to remember it. But um, I mean, recently, um, the Psychologist, which is the British Psychological Society's magazine, the editor of that, uh, John Sutton, set me up with an interview with um, Celia um, Hood, and who uh, does some really cool stuff um, in applying academic insight into game design and the user experience. And she does some really cool stuff um, and has that kind of really nice balance between the academic insight and the industry knowledge. So having the opportunity to, to do sort of a, an interview with her was, was lovely, actually. Um, because you know she she's she does some great stuff. I'm very you know admire the kind of stuff she does, and she she breaks things down. And she's one of these people who's really excellent at um, sort of science communication. And you know, in the book books that she's got, she she kind of breaks things down in such a, a way that's so accessible. Um, you know, to people who might work in industry, for example. Um, so that was that was a nice opportunity. Um, one I can remember because it was quite recent, so I'm sure there's probably plenty of others, others as well. No, that's fair. I mean, you know, Celia Holden is is a, an incredible force. I think it's fair to say <laughs> she is. And then, yeah, uh, what she, she does like that's okay. That's that's pretty. That's pretty top tier. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Um, yeah, it's a shame I just didn't actually properly kind of be in the same room as her. But you know, the fact that we had that level of interaction and and uh, you know, really. Um, grateful for John Sutton for actually setting that up actually it was him who kind of facilitated that idea and brought us together so I'll be honest I'm sure I could have contacted I'm, her on Twitter to be honest but it was nice that, that was kind of mediated I'm, I'm not sure the the universe could have withstood both years in the same room that might have been too much um so <laughs> maybe it was just like a public health and safety thing and it had to be done online like yeah massive risk assessment you know to get you know anywhere too close to the hadron collide that you know, <laughs> Uh, so let's let's move on then let's talk about your new book you've got a new book coming out again links to pre-order will be attached to wherever you found this thank you yes it's very exciting so this is the first book i've uh, i've written I've, I've written chapters for the people's books before and edited things but this is the first book i've actually written and it's it's been a really nice journey actually doing that and so it's um it's called issues and debates in cyber psychology and it, kind of does what it says on the tin really um it's i mean there's some really really great text out there in cyber psychology actually and um i've certainly used a lot of them on you know my reading lists and have been really informative for me um as a researcher in this area but i'd observed there wasn't really any kind of core text that sort of situated the evidence around what kind of core debates are currently um around so things like you know is social media good for well-being? You know, the kind of questions that you often see in the media and all that kind of stuff, questions I get asked by journalists and everything. So it seemed to me that having a resource that was kind of situated around those debates would possibly be useful. 
not just for students and academics, but maybe for you know, journalists, media experts, whatever. So, um, yeah, that's what the, the book is. Um, and it should be published, I think it's the 9th of January. So it is available to pre-order. Um, and it's a very reasonable price. I'm just on Amazon at the moment, under £20. I would like to get it into some more small, smaller local independent bookshops, though. And I'm just working on that one at the moment. Excellent. Um, yeah. um, so... Is it is it more of a, a textbook style of book? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's it's academic, um. So it's 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 around evidence and is referenced and so on. But uh, part of writing it has been making sure that it is accessible, um, and trying to avoid where necessary, you know, academic jargon and where where possible. Obviously, it's not always possible, but just make it really clear what the kind of key messages are. And this so is something I've just been sort of writing a bit about today, actually, for the session I'm doing for, for my colleague. Um, but, you know, the, the key things with any external engagement and stuff is just knowing what those key messages are. And if, if you orientate everything around that and keep that at the heart of what you're doing, then it should be engaging and should be accessible. So, you know, I sort of think, well, what, what are the key things I want to make sure... Are translated here and the the book publisher um, open um university press has been really good on allowing me to put sort of different pedagogic things in there like take home boxes and and things so that those things are really kind of clear and sort of easy to to access and things so yeah it's it's been great and another thing that the my publisher has been good at is supporting me when i came up with the idea of doing little video um excerpts so um, on my website, I've got a whole page now where I'm hosting these sort of cyber bites, um, which I, I Ooh, kind of host that, on YouTube. Now that, now that sounds like a serial I'd buy. Oh, what, sorry? The serial I'd buy, cyber bites. Cyber bites. <laughs> yeah, it does a bit, actually. Mm, um, the and yeah, the this taste is of just... knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. You can have them and digest them in small amounts. It's great. So, um, yeah, this is just basically... Um, I mean, I'm using them at the moment, really, as part of the publicity, if I'm being completely honest. But um, I hope it will be useful. And it's basically just a very short video, like no more than two minutes, which summarises the take home things of each chapter in the book. Um, and that, you know, I, I'd hope that if people want to put my book on their reading list, then they could use that as like a kind of companion hear from the author kind of thing. And I'll certainly be using it in my own module as well. So um, it's, yeah, um, I think that kind of helps that message get across as well, having that those little bites alongside it. Because, I mean, you know, we've, we've talked about this offline and it kind of is, is the ethos to kind of the science that uh, you know, we're working on, I guess you could say. But I've co now, kind of noticed there's two kind of like distinct uh, tracks people go down. I think you see people that maybe write a more uh, academic textbook type of book and then reframe that in a much more kind of uh lay person perspective you know like oh well it's for public consumption and then there's an argument on the other track that well actually academic shouldn't be separate anyone should be able to pick up a book and read it um an example like you know, that i'm reading at the moment i'm reading why women are blamed for everything by dr jessica taylor um and it's it's got a lot of academic uh discussion in it but it, it is explained in such a way that i think anyone could pick it up and read it you know, so like where it's like methodology and it's very heavily referenced, which for the type of book, it's, that's important. Um, but like, I think that anyone could listen to it and, and find it inform informative. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's important to get that balance right. And I suppose if it was looking at it one end or other of the continuum, it would probably more like more towards the academic um, end of it. But, you know, I think... I mean, the good thing about psychology generally, actually, and I found in my research is just generally the topic is accessible because it speaks to people and um, people have something in their own lives that they can relate to with lots of these issues. So in some way that kind of makes it accessible in that you, you have that kind of experience that you, you, you've experienced that choice of word <laughs> um, these these experiences that you know you you're aware of and you you understand these issues in practice from your own experience so um they, they can kind of be accessible in that way anyway um and i always find you know if i'm doing talks or whatever people it's it's always quite easy to capture your audience because people 
either know somebody who might have a smartphone issue or, you know, whatever it is, you know, they, they know that how technology is related to the way that they use it in everyday life. So it's often quite easy to kind of um, draw out the academic stuff because there's something kind of there anyway in terms of accessibility of, of those experiences. Yeah. yeah, no, that that makes that makes sense. I think you know, uh, especially when, as you might say, there was kind of a, a gap in the market anyway. Like you know, you've got to start somewhere, right? And um, it's definitely the kind of thing that you want to be seen on reading list because it's it's. I you know, I imagine the hope is that it will become a core text. You know, is that not the ambition? I guess. Hopefully, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's I say there's really good texts out there already, which I would always class as, as core text. This may more be sort of supplementary to that. I don't know. Um, the trouble with, I suppose, any book in cyber psychology, it becomes very quickly out of date. And I suppose this one is, is no different on that one. You know, I'm already, you know, thinking, oh, these are things I need to now put in edition two. Well, uh, no, because there's say, already new research come out. It's like, oh, all, it's too late to include it All more reason for uh, your publishers to give you a second edition. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, they've been great to work with. And I think, you know, I've been very efficient with them. So I, I, I'd hope they'd be supportive of a second edition. Um, but yeah, they, um, I mean, yeah, there's already scope for at least one of the chapters to have an even new edition already. And, you know, I've only just approved all the proofs for it. You know, it's it's crazy. Well, I mean, have you, have you got anything else you'd like to sort of say about the book generally? I mean, how did you find, you said it's the first book that you've written in its entirety. How was that as an experience? It was good. I mean, I did it during a global pandemic and I think, <laughs> I mean, I've written in the kind of, the sort of pre preface thing. I don't know whether that was um, like idiotic or, or genius. but um, <laughs> The line can be quite thin <laughs> at times. Yeah, I think in this case it probably is. I, I found it okay. Um, what I found it really useful for was, and this is where the sort of synthesis really comes in and I'm did sort of note that earlier and then didn't actually follow up on that, which I've now just thought remembered. Um, I'd, I've just found myself in the last few years sort of doing so much stuff and whether it's consultancy or BPS stuff or teaching or research or whatever, um, and not really ever getting an opportunity to kind of bring all that together. And what was the book was really useful for was had all these things buzzing around in my head and it actually gave me an opportunity to sit down and think, right, I'm talking about these issues when I'm doing media things, I'm writing about this, how does it all fit together? Um, and it was really nice, actually, to sort of synthesise that and just have an opportunity to kind of get it all in one place. Um, and that was very sort of gratified. I, was, I felt so much more satisfied having done that because I thought, ah, oh, I know where I'm at now. I know where I'm up to on this issue now because I've had the opportunity to piece all these disparate things together, which actually weren't disparate things. They were just different parts of a different piece of the puzzle I think um so it's really useful doing that and it's definitely kind of crystallized my own thinking about things which I then find much easier when I come to write stuff or do talks on stuff or know what I need to do next so um the actual process of writing I actually found quite enjoyable actually because I actually quite like writing and um, quite efficient at it generally so um yeah, it was it was a good experience generally. The only the probably the most negative thing was very recently when I was writing the index. That was the most brain numbing thing mm -hmm. <laughs> I've ever done. Um, yeah, the publisher could have done it, but um, they would have taken stuff out of my royalties. And just, yeah, didn't yeah. want my royalties to because of that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I hate to I say it slightly tongue in cheek, but you know, unfortunately, you might have to update the video game cyber psychology bit by the time you come to do edition two because there's, there's some hot research being done on that at the moment. Um, Absolutely, yeah. and yeah, and it, it might be you know that some of those chapters get expanded out because you know it might be that there's issues that need teasing out further on some of those things. So I think that could be a nice nice avenue actually to to develop edition two definitely. Well, if you want someone yeah. to write a chapter for one of your books. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Shameless Excellent. plug. Thank you for your excellent offer. Uh, um, have you, have you thought about maybe this is a very premature question, but have you thought about like, like would you write another book? Would you, if so, what what would it be on? Would you would you write would you write a novel? Why not? Um, probably not a novel. I always used to enjoy kind of creative writing when I was I was younger. I used to really enjoy doing that. I used to just sometimes write stories for fun. I'm just a geek. Um. 
but no, I probably wouldn't write a novel. I know I've got colleagues who've written loads of books, novels, and um, non-fiction books as well. Um, no, I'd, 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 I've enjoyed the experience this time, so I think I'd pro I probably would be up for writing another book. What it would be on? I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know at this point, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't. It's been favourable so far, um, so it wouldn't be something I'd turn down, I don't think. Depending what it, you know, the offer was, I suppose. So if you're a publisher out there listening, you know, Linda's, she'll think about it. Table, <laughs> table the right offer, you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think, mm. like, I mean, you know, again, like I'm, I've, I'm quite busy as it is, you know, as you, as you very well know. You are uh, busy. But the, I, I like love the idea of writing a book and being able to like bring one's own sort of compilations and stuff. I think the problem I've encountered is that as I've been reading more around this, I've read a lot of books that I sit there and go, I wish I could have contributed to. Not that I have any right to have done that, but, you know, like uh, Professor Peter Eccles, uh, Etchell's, sorry, uh, Lost in a Good Game, you know, Checkpoint by Joe Donnelly, The Psychology of Final Fantasy and um, Legend of Zelda series, uh, edited by Dr. Anthony Bean. Like, this, I mean, there's some great, that is like a, you know, a Rolls Royce list of people talking about some of their favourite games. And the great reads, by the way, I'd happily plug all of those books. Um really really good books out there and a lot have been very you know recent as well really so it's yeah it's i always feel very, very grateful to be around you know people doing great stuff so yeah it's good whereas i have that kind of like you know that kind of like i'd wish i'd written that song that kind of like i wish i'd written this book i could, I could you know too late <laughs> too late Miss something it. else come up something yeah no that, that just means something better will, will come up <laughs> so, at the right time as well <laughs> i mean we we've just gone through the very long list of stuff that you get up to professionally um or is that the first question <laughs> yeah that we you know this this can be a two-part let's brace yourselves um what what do you do when you're not doing all that you, you mentioned you have some hobbies somehow yes, what what do. what do they look like and you know <laughs> yeah so um, i'm in two choirs um so one of those well they're both sort of community choirs i guess um one of them is a local one. Um, so I live in Chorley um, in Lancashire and uh, it's just a, a very local one there. And we sing loads of great songs, actually tends to be sort of pop songs. So we do medleys like Elton John. We've done Queen before. We've done uh, Bowie. We've done, uh, what else have we done? Um, Beatles, lots of great stuff. A great arrangements, actually. Um, the choir leaders are really, really cool. So there's that one, um, and uh, the other choir I'm in is a um, all female a cappella choir, which is I always find it's a bit more demanding. It's a bit more difficult. So that one kind of challenges me a lot more um, than the other one. Um, both are a lot of fun. So yes, um, so I, I basically am singing when um, I've got spare time and rehearsing, and we can actually finally rehearse together now. You know, during lockdown was. Didn't really feel like you're in a choir where you're on Zoom and you can't hear anybody else singing. You know, it kind of misses the whole point of being in a choir. Um, so yeah, it's it's nice to be able to sing together, and it's just a nice sort of. It's lovely to sort of synchronize with other people and feel connected to other people, and it's wonderful. So I mean, does that? I know you know you've got other hobbies, but just to pick that up a little bit. So I mean, you 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 big fan of music you're often blasting the tunes around the house you sing you know the kind of person that sings while they're doing the cleaning i mean i do you know i i, I, I go full lot, on yeah i go full on freddie mercury i want to break free out there with the hoover like just getting into it you know yeah i, I do sing a lot and um I'm, I'm very lucky where i live I'm, I'm actually have a detached house which is probably a good job because i think my neighbors would hate me but my kitchen has <laughs> amazing acoustics so um, it's a really great great environment to sing in um, so yeah that, that's that's usually where I sing and um, yeah often when I'm cleaning I'll sort of blast out songs as well but yeah it's um, it's a lot of fun but I mean my my music playlist is very eclectic it goes from you know one extra dream to the other it could be you know like Disney sing along to like Nine uh, sort of seventies rock, you know. <laughs> you know, if I put it on like you know playlist or mix one, it, you could get anything. Um, so yeah, it's a bit. I, I don't subject other people to my music, by the way. I don't think that's fair on anyone. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So if you were gonna like do like uh, I don't know, maybe like the top ten listen to songs on on like your your platform of choice because many platforms are available. What what do you think would sort of come up? You know. Just to give us a, a flavour of that that wide taste. 
Yeah, I mean, I think people like, you know, Elton John, like the classics and things, that would have got quite a lot of his songs on. I'm actually a really big Tom Jones fan, actually. I've just a lot of his older music, actually. It's not unusual. I don't know why. <laughs> hey. Uh, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um yeah, um lots of him. What else might be on? Um actually I love musicals, um, and because I just love singing along to musicals as well. So I'd say a lot of musical albums and songs from the sort of showstoppers, Broadway things will come up a lot. Um anything I can sing along to, actually. I mean, I don't tend to maybe sing along so much to like the Elton Johns, that might be more car music. Um, but yeah, definitely musicals would be the thing I'd be blasting out in my kitchen. Would you ever <laughs> ever do any like like would you ever take a role in a musical or like do like a a concert like 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 solo or something you know like or an open mic maybe? Oh, I mean, I'd love to, but I just do not have the confidence to do that. Um, I've I've done you know choir performances before. Um, you know, done competitions as a choir. Um, I've performed you know, with a violin and piano doing concerts before. I've done, you know, I'm a trained, you know, gymnast and I've done gymnastics routines in front of audience before. I probably just would not want to sing in front of people on my own, which is just ridiculous. Um, oh, that's fine. When you think about the fact I've done a TED talk in front of like, you know, a thousand people plus others who might have been watching. I mean, I don't know why, but just singing uh, just in front of people just petrifies me if I'm not in a choir. But I'd love to. I mean, that would be such a dream to be blasting out on a Broadway stage, you know, one of so, the classics. So a colleague, I mean, a, a colleague threw this question to me, uh, and I'll pose it <laughs> to yourself now, and, and I'll ask for a musical as well. But um, you're at the Royal Albert Hall for a gig. <laughs> um, the support act hasn't shown up. And <laughs> the stage manager has seen your, your stuff on YouTube, and they say, can you go on and fill for at least 10 minutes? What would oh, you do? God. So you don't have to like don't um, don't like get yourself all angsty like thinking about that happening. But what what would that be? You've got like a mini set, maybe like two two three songs. What would you pick? Um, I'd probably do like actually like a a medley or something from musicals, like a, a you know a set list of those. So it would just be you know, I mean, what my absolute all time favorite musical is Phantom of the Opera. I mean, I, I remember seeing that when I was I think it was about fifteen at the Alhambra in Bradford, and I absolutely fell in love with it, and I don't think I've ever fallen out of love with it. So, I mean, I'd love to sing something from that, um, or maybe something from Wicked, or um, any of the big ones, really, to be quite honest. Maybe Hamilton. You know, I mean, a lot of the songs in Hamilton tend to be more the men <laughs> songs, but there are some women ones. Um, yeah, any of those sort of big numbers, I guess. Maybe Memory from Cats. That's, well, that's I was gonna say if you could just, one. if you could pick any musical to, I won't say star oh. again, but like if to feature in to be in. Uh, it would probably have to be Phantom of the Opera then. Okay, fair. That's fair. Um, so I mean, that's that's some pretty your music I found through through these <laughs> discussions is just so it's such a big thing for so many people, uh, and I think that's really great. And there is such diversity in it. Um, so what what else you mentioned? I think a few other things at the top of the show. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like to get out and about walking. Um, that's definitely something I've done more and more regularly, actually, since, I suppose, lockdowns and things. Um, it was all we could do. <laughs> could do, exactly. Um, and, you know, particularly when weather's nice. I'm a bit of a fair weather walker, actually. Um, just getting out and about is always nice. Um, I'm really lucky where I live is that, you know, it's really not far to get to, like, the Lake District. So even locally, there's some really nice sort of scenic walks, walks around. So... Yeah, I can be in the Lake Districts and the South Lakes for in, within about an hour, so it's 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 really nice. It's lovely. I feel very lucky to be in this part of the country. Um, and yes, I like doing that if the weather's rubbish. Um, and then I mean, I'm a, a big film geek, so I just love my films. So I could just spend, particularly if the weather's bad, I could just spend an entire weekend in front of the TV watching films or Netflix or something. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably spend quite a bit of time with that as well. Okay, so I feel obliged to ask how, um, how just how do you do do it? I mean, you you're so active, <laughs> yet you seem to find time for your hobby. I mean, is there actually like have you got a clone that you actually like team up with? Like, is that how it like how? Yeah, you're not the first person who asked if I've got a clone, actually. Um, Chris Fullwood, who's on the Cybersite Committee, has actually asked that before. Um, well, I do actually have a twin, um, but she, yeah, she, I don't the, use her as a clone. Hold the presses. <laughs> 
Stop the presses. Hold on. I do. I do have an identical twin. <laughs> um, yeah, she she doesn't actually uh, operate as my clone. Um, yeah, she's um, she's a. That's exactly uh, the kind of thing assistant. a clone would say, Linda. <laughs> no, she's um, she's an executive assistant, um, and she she works. She does she does all sorts. Actually, she's brilliant. But she, uh, yeah, she she's ultra organized, ultra amazing, and basically keeps businesses on track by you know scheduling meetings at the right time and keeping them you know in order. Uh, so she does a good job there. But um, yeah, I'm I am kind of very conscientious during the working week, and I start work actually really quite early usually seven half seven in the morning but that means I'm usually done working by four <laughs> or if I am working after four I don't feel too guilty about it um it can be these nice fun things which are work related but you know not you know hardcore work um so I I just am very conscientious during the working week and you know I'll just get stuff done I'm very efficient usually and quite efficient with time and resources um which means then at the weekend, I, I very rarely work at the weekend. Actually, very rarely work in the evening, actually. And I think that is part of the reason why I'm so efficient and productive during the week, because I always have a break. <laughs> um, so, you know, people work differently. People have different schedules. Some people work better in the evening. I work much better in the morning. I'm a morning person. So I, I work when I know I work best, <laughs> if that makes sense. I know I don't work very well in the evenings. So there's no point trying to be productive then. Um, I mean, that in of itself so I, could say is a, is a pretty big skill, like knowing when you work best and then trying to operate in that time. I mean, I've had... It takes a while to me. And, and I won't name names, but like I've had emails from staff like at like 11 p.m. And I'm like, yeah. what do you... Get to sleep, get to bed, <laughs> please. Like, I, I, I'm always like, I appreciate you sending that email. I understand that took effort and work and you're doing this in an out of work time. But why? Why? Please, I'm concerned. <laughs> like... Yeah, I mean, I said, I'm, I'm never like to kind of suggest that working at different, you know, more unsocial hours is, is wrong because that might be right for somebody. And if they've got, you know, this schedule that means they work better at that time, that's fair enough. Um, but, you know, as long as people have got ways of... Um, of working in a way and making sure that's balanced with life, then people can do what they want. And as long as it doesn't put undue pressure on for other people to work in the same way or put the same amount of expectations on other people. And I'm always very, very wary of that. You know, I, I often put a lot of expectation on myself, but I always, I'm always very mindful about making sure I'm not putting that as pressure on other people. Um, that, but particularly if I'm collaborating with people, you know, I, and I, I wrote, I did a, a blog post about this actually. Um, I am a self-confessed procrastinator. Oh, I read, and, I read this um, piece. This, people... I, I felt very seen. <laughs> <laughs> I see you are as well. It's interesting. Um, so several years ago, um, I was in my office at work, and our colleague, who's Damien actually, I'm um, a very good friend with Damien, and he he came in. He said, "You're a procrastinator," and I was like. What, 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 what's that? <laughs> um, and he just read this psychological science article, um, which is basically about this. And it's basically people who will do things, probably will have this compulsion to do things much earlier in a very timely way before they might be needed, but end up often having to do more because they've done it too early. Um, so rather than procrastinators who tend to put things off and who might do things last minute or late, Procrastinators just have a compulsion to get stuff done. And it usually does end up, you actually end up doing more. I'll tell you a classic example of this. I've now updated my module handbook three times and had to re-upload it to Blackboard for this coming academic year because people have said, oh, can you make sure this goes in your module handbook? I was like, I've already done my module handbook. <laughs> I need to do it again. So it's a classic example. If I'd waited till next week or the week after, I probably wouldn't have had to amend it three times now. Um, and it's a classic example. And so, yes, the point I was making about this is that I'm very aware that I work in this probably quite unhealthy way, actually, in many ways. Um, and I put that pressure in. And sometimes I'm speeding ahead with doing things, which probably isn't the best way to work. Um, because I acknowledge working through things a bit more slower, um, nurturing things quite often, particularly in academia, is actually really useful. Um, and so if I'm working with other people, I will always be mindful about not putting that same pressure on them. 
you know, the slowness actually sometimes is really useful. Um, and even though it might be really stressful for me going, I really need this paper written up, I, I just have to just keep storm. And it's, um, it, it's a useful lesson, actually. And that's why I like collaborating, because you learn a lot from working with other people. But I've learned a lot about myself from working with other people. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So you're a procrastinator too. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, so again, it's like if, if you're watching this as opposed to listening to it, the video will be on YouTube by the time you're hearing it. Uh, you know, like I do all like the, the link to the guest and stuff and all that, like ahead of time. I have those ready, you know, the layouts and stuff. I design those ahead of the interview. I don't do it on the day because like, the idea of that makes me nervous. Uh, so I'm definitely in, in that boat, I think. <laughs> um yeah, I mean that's quite, I don't know, almost quite, quite a nice sweet note there. With, with just all about learning about yourself and about other people. I mean, collaboration is a very useful and powerful tool. Um, my next question is: I realize a bit, a bit of a meme between between us, because uh, we joke about it. And you sort of spoke at the top about, <clears throat> pardon me, passing the baton on. But uh, I always ask: Have you played anything good lately? And the joke is that uh, we would argue that you don't play enough video games, and the i know it's so ironic um i, I you know I, I don't get asked so, so much now at conferences and things so i don't tend to be presenting on gaming research but i i particularly as a a woman as well people always you know kind of surprised like oh what are you doing gaming research or oh, are you a gamer and the answer is no <laughs> which is so ironic I, i'm just interested in the psychology of it I, i'm not actually interested you know i'm actually a play games myself but yeah i think it's, it's a very uh, ironic kind of thing place to be in um yeah i don't play I'll, enough games apparently I'll just give everyone well, i don't a have second. time to do it i'll just give everyone you were saying second. earlier i don't know how many times i'll give people there a second to pick themselves up after that revelation <laughs> of games research that doesn't play games massive breaking news that goes against all the canon <laughs> but it's fine it's all good no shade so i mean have you played anything good out of interest? Anything that you're like, oh, I remember that being a good game. Like... Uh, I suppose the, the memories of that come back from when I was like really little and my, my dad had an Atari um, and I used to love playing that actually um, with Pac-Man and Space Raiders, you know, the classics really. And those are the, the kind of, I mean, I've played like little mobile games and stuff like that, you know, here and there, but yeah, I mean, those are the only games that kind of really come back as being memorable, really. And that was when we had a joystick. I mean, that, that's how old I am. I mean, when are we going <laughs> to get some, I'm going to say, YouTube content of like, you know, like Cyber Doctor plays Celeste or Animal <laughs> Crossings or something? I mean, that that's what the world You'll needs. You'll never find it. Right. No, um, maybe it does. I don't know. Um, I mean, if you want to see me sort of just getting an angry because I don't know what I'm doing, that's fine. Anyway. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. pe- I don't people, think it'll be that interesting. People would watch. <laughs> but it's like goggle box, you know, you just watch people, you know, being entertained by stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it'll be the most entertaining thing in the world, to be honest. It'll be me just going, <laughs> what do I do? What was my press? <laughs> fair, fair enough. So I, I will <laughs> I will reshape the question to you mentioned you're a bit of a film buff. Have you watched anything hmm. good lately? Are you a frequent cinema goer? I always used to be. Um, I've not been to the cinema pre uh, since pre pandemic though. Um, still don't quite feel safe to do that and be in a kind of enclosed, non ventilated space. Um, but yes, I when I have um, Netflix, I've got Disney Plus, you know, all the kind of streaming services. But I suppose um, the most recent things I've been watching. Um, Actually, probably I've been watching quite a lot of the Marvel stuff recently on Disney Plus. Going kind of going through those. I was talking to Jess, um, one of our um, colleagues from Edgehill, about this earlier today. Actually, and she was saying she she's watching Marvel, and um, there's quite a few I haven't seen yet. But um, yeah, I'm really enjoying those. those are you, are you those going are good... through them in like date order, MCU order, canonical order for each series? I'm not. Which I probably should be because I, I didn't know what best what the best order was to be honest. So I thought. Oh, I'll just watch the ones that because I've seen quite a lot of them. I've seen quite a few of them at the cinema, um, but there's some some I just never really got around to seeing. So I'm just sort of picking, sort of pick and mix, kind of, which probably isn't the right way to do it. Actually, I, I, I suppose that's <laughs> part of the versatility of the MCU. As it was, is that you could do. You that. can watch them in themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But yeah, so yeah, um, I'm just trying to think what else I've seen recently. It's different. See, I, this is interesting. Actually, I was, I was talking about this to somebody the other day and. Going to the cinema has a whole 
experience around it. And I think it makes it much more memorable about th things you've seen. And I was thinking this the other day about what our memories of new films might be if they've just been streamed rather than shown at the cinema. Um, and it's it does kind of play on you, actually. It, it, which is why now I'm kind of trying to recall what I'm watching because I'm just like, what new things have I seen I, recently? I always I joke. I don't know. <laughs> I always joke that the cinema thing is a British thing because of how expensive it is. You'd remember it because just how much of an ordeal and an event it was trying to get there with people and you're trying to find your seats and someone always needs to go to the toilet and you, you, every, someone is always unhappy to pay the prices for the snacks. There's always someone that thinks the tickets are too expensive. Uh, I, I always joke that it's that inherent Britishness of like not willing to pay that much to watch a film that makes it memorable. It probably is, actually. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Although, actually... Um... I, I leave it a lot of that. I actually would go to the cinema on my own, to be honest. So you don't have everybody else complaining about stuff. You just get on with it. You don't have to argue about what film you want to see, where you're sitting, whether you need to get confectionaries or not. You know, just just get on with it. It's I great. mean, the answer is the answer is yes. Cinema popcorn is great. You know, like always. Fair um, enough. Yeah. In my view. Um, well, I want to I want to pick something back up there in a second. But are you are you excited for any upcoming releases? I'm very very hyped for the new June film at the time of recording. Is that mm. in a, a couple of weeks? Oh no, um, I, I'm looking forward to finally being able to see the Bond film, which obviously got postponed um, through pandemic. Um, so it'd be nice. I mean, I think it's Daniel Craig's last one, and he is he's I think he's the best Bond. I, I'm, you know. So um, well, I'm that's, like, that's an interesting statement. I know, I know that's probably controversial, but I, I, I'd say he's the best film. Most I mean, he's people... not always necessarily been the best films, no, although fair. some of them are. Again, yeah. as a psychologist, this might be interesting to kind of tap because a lot of people kind of say nostalgia is responsible for their favorite Bond. The joke being your favorite Bond is the one you grew up with, usually. And like even like in my case, like the the first Bond I remember watching was Pierce Brosnan. Even though Brosnan. the first yeah. one, Daniel Craig was the first Bond that I was like, I went to the cinema to see Casino Royale when it came out. You know, um, like Mads Mikkelsen was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That. I mean, yeah, the first one I would. But like the first Bond, you just kind of is—is is that just nostalgia or? Probably is actually, but yeah, it'd be similar. Like the the one I remember growing up would have been Pierce Brosnan as well. Um, obviously watched all the others sort of retrospectively. No, I think maybe I was just a bit bit young, or maybe the just Bond didn't speak to me in the same way. I don't know, but you know, you you appreciate films in different ways as you know when you're older compared to when you're younger. Maybe maybe nostalgia has a role in it though, possibly. But no, I, I do think Daniel Craig is the best Bond. I think he, he kind of encapsulates Bond best. Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, like, there's. I mean, we could go into a whole. It's a whole other podcast of what is Bond, and that's a. It's a very interesting kind of uh, rabbit hole to fall down. <laughs> um, well, yeah, the whole double or seven thing, and then when people saying, "Oh no, you might have a female double or seven, like, oh no, you can't have a female Bond. It's like, no, it would be double or seven, not Bond. <laughs> There's a distinction. <laughs> it's just a number. <laughs> so yeah, that, that kind of wound me up a bit that people were just misunderstanding that. And it, yeah. I think uh, if they were going to take a lesson for anywhere, look at Doctor Who. You know, it, it took far too long to have a female exactly. Doctor Who. Exactly, and that was such a great, great move. She's um, great. So uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but kind of what is, what's the next thing on your work? What's coming up next? Oh, what is coming up next? Um, a lot of bits and bobs, really. I mean, we're continuing with the emoji stuff. So we've got sort of some studies planned out there. So just to kind of hopefully more or less sort of finish off some of those things there and tie up a few loose ends. Um, all this stuff, I suppose, is just... Um, my mind's gone a bit blank now. I can't think. <laughs> You're doing that much. Like, you're just that busy. <laughs> I, know, I just can't think what else we're doing. Um, I mean, I'm on, I'm on sort of other collaborations and stuff with other people. But I mean, to be honest, a lot of the stuff I'm doing is more just on, you know, other people's teams and just sort of mentoring or, or whatever. So, yeah, definitely the emoji stuff is, is definitely there. We've got that kind of planned out. Um, but, yeah, other stuff that's just asking cool questions, basically. Because <laughs> well, I can't think. Of one, of, one of my favourite questions in these interviews is, is this next one. And it, if you had no limitations, what would you what would you like to do? Complete blue sky, unlimited budget, access to uh, participants, a huge research team, everyone, anyone you could ever need to do anything, you've got it. 
what would your research be? And I always preface, and again, apologies if you listened before with us, but you know, mine would be get people to play Celeste and record their just all of their responses to that through that journey. <laughs> Right. Be cool. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it would just be access to actually, you know, data. Actually, um, I don't care about people; I just want the data. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe that's maybe too much of a scientist. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting you know, be able to cooperate with social media companies, which let's face it, are not easy to cooperate with. Um, and, you know, just be able to actually get all that data about people and different types of interactions they have on social media, be able to do, you know, network analysis and all this kind of stuff with it. And you can answer some really cool questions by looking at, you know, the level of interaction people have with each other, where how central people are in communities. And uh, I mean, you can use social network analysis now, you know, for public data. But I mean, I'm talking about the kind of the stuff that you usually have to go through a whole ethics process for and get loads of permissions for and you really you know, want to difficult. be able to get in, like a paper that's like we know what your emoji said last summer kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good title for a paper i love that yeah so yeah those kind of things really just having that real data and not have to go through the whole because usually with research i mean it's the permissions and ethics thing that puts so much constraints on it and i'm not saying that's a bad thing you know ethics are there for a reason and you know are important um but of course it does put um constraints on what you can do and, and can't do so yeah i mean having that real data and loads of it uh, the richness of it and um, to be able to do stuff with it and m network map it out in different ways and understand how it corresponds to all sorts of things like well-being and you know just to be able to this it's a scalability i think that you know would be um would be nice to do that kind of stuff okay that's pretty yeah. good um so last sort of formal question then i do want to go back to something you said before uh and this is a new question so apologies you kind of it's been tested on you but it came to me like oh, mid, in your middle of the series but um is there a, a person like you or, or thing that inspires you like you know i, I can reel off a list of people that inspire me like academically and personally there's none of them in this interview at the moment or anything at all don't worry about that uh jokes uh <laughs> but like you know is there anyone that you were able to draw inspiration from yes uh, you, you kind of preempted this earlier so i'm glad you did because it had given me time to think about it so thank you um there, there are lots of people who inspire me so um i mean a lot a lot of them would be, tend to be women because you know it's useful having good role models and things that's not to say men don't inspire me they do um but so i think this one's a really very academic -y one um and somebody who i think does some such cool stuff and it speaks to me quite a lot and she's uh, she's called dr jess wade and i don't know if any of you listening will have heard of her but she is a physicist um at uh, i think it's imperial london and she spends basically every day at some point creating Wikipedia pages for uh, underrepresented female scientists. So she's done this every single day for years. And um, I've heard her speak before and she, she's very humble, a really inspirational person who is really just getting representation much better out there for not just women, but often black women or from uh, minorities. And um, you know, I kind of look at the, the investment that she's made in doing that and just think, wow, I mean, what a wonderful kind of selfless thing to do and to spend time doing. And, you know, if, when, when I've heard her speak before, she's talked about the kind of potential impact that's had because then she's seen on that very year, those people have then been nominated for these sort of national awards because of the representation that people now are aware of these people. So I just think, you know, that's, and this is through Wikipedia, you know, that's the only one thing to say is that Wikipedia is often sort of badly thought of in terms of being a source that might not be reliable because it's editable. But the kind of flip side is that what can people do with this kind of open source, I guess you could call it, where you can just do such amazing things with this platform. So, yeah, um, I'd like to say she she's... The, the, what she does is, is very inspirational and the way she approaches it being so humble and, and modest about it is very very humbling as well so uh, yes i'd like to give uh, a big thumbs up to her <laughs> and that's fair i mean it is worth saying it you know this is a new question so i'm kind of just we're, we're trying it as we go but like you know obviously one draws inspiration for many people and 
Everyone Absolutely, yeah. Things, it's difficult it, pinpointing. It's just nice yeah. to give uh, people uh, the space to, to, as you've just done there, give recognition to someone that they really do admire and, and get inspiration from. Um, so I'd like to go back to, if you wouldn't mind talking about it, you mentioned like you know, you're happy to go to the cinema alone. Uh, something like that uh, that's something i've done uh, you recently did a twitter thread about uh, <laughs> the challenges in being like a single person trying to do things on your own um if if you've been with us before if you've been on stream i i really dislike this discourse that your entire value socially is dependent on if you're in a romantic relationship for some reason um and it's completely arbitrary i literally i think in a blog post i told it to f off as an ideology um would you like to just talk a bit more about like that thread and, and the experiences you've had there yeah um the the reason that that prompted that was i mean there have been numerous experiences over the last few years but this one for me just really kind of uh it just sort of really motivated me and this was basically i was trying to book um it's, it's a bit sad but it's just a little canal cruise thing and it's just a little afternoon tea thing uh, not firstly not I'm sad just, if that's a thing you like to okay. do, you like to do. <laughs> let's just clarify that you know no it's like a middle-aged thing to do no but, hobby shaming uh, on this podcast let's just get that out there <laughs> yeah i just thought it'll be nice you know it's in a, a scenic part of the world um so anyway so i wanted to book this and um, I booked it obviously just for me and then the organizer sort of emailed me after saying oh um I just want to check um you've just booked for one I just want to make sure that you're not booking to join another party already booked and I was like no I've booked for one because it's a treat for me from me <laughs> don't worry <laughs> I didn't make a mistake and it kind of um iteratively over the last few years there have been so many examples of where it's you've been kind of made you feel that you're kind of wrong because you're not in a couple or in a, a group or whatever. So there'd been so many instances, um, you know, when I'd sort of turned up for like nature walks and things when I was in Centre Parks a couple of years ago and there was kind of a group nature walk thing. I thought that'd be nice to do. And um, everybody was sort of waiting outside this little hut thing for the, the guy to come out. And everybody was there and, you know, had our tickets there and and he'd basically checked everybody else's tickets and, and then it was just like, oh, no, we'll, we'll set off. We're, we're just waiting for the last group. Well, the group was me, and I was still just literally standing there with everybody else. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm here. If, if it's me you're waiting for, like, oh, yeah, just expected. I was I should have been there in a group rather than on my own. And there was lots of other examples of, of this kind of thing. And it was just like, why, why is this so difficult? And why can't people kind of understand that people in the you know hospitality and leisure sort of industries don't seem quite to be well adjusted to this like often you can only book and um, like three booking apps and things for restaurants you can't book for one it's usually the default is two or more it's like people can eat on their own you know it's allowed it's possible so I mean, yeah it's it just kind of wound me up a bit i i'm a big proponent i mean like you said there treat yourself a treat from you to you uh, i've yeah. taken myself out to dinner many a time I, I will go out and just take an audio book with me or a good podcast like this one you're listening to right now. Don't forget to like, subscribe, <laughs> review um, and and just have a whale of a time myself. Like, what's the problem with like it? Uh, but but it is funny. There is always this kind of like are you, are you sh you're not you're not waiting for anyone that that weird reaction. And it, I yeah. find that to be really juxtaposed to how gaming is perceived. Like, you know, like, you know, like a. Even in social settings, it's like you expect people to be on their own. You know, you don't expect people to turn up in groups to like maybe like yeah, gaming cafes and things like that. It's kind of like, there's that um, perception of oh, you know, it's it's a one person like you know in the, the mum's basement is the stereotype, isn't it? Um, well, it's just it, it's just really strange to hear that like you you've had those experiences and faced like such just outright discrimination just for being yeah, a I mean, person. Yeah, I mean. I don't think I've ever sort of felt, you know, felt it was, it's, it's never been hostile. It's never been, you know, intended to be discriminatory, but, you know, it does kind of just start to grate a bit when it kind of happens, you know, a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, it's been all right the last year or so because I've not really gone anywhere. So, you know. That's what made me the benefit of the pandemic. You know, if you watch sitting there watching Disney Plus, you know, Disney Plus doesn't know that you're sitting on your own. It doesn't discriminate. Um, but, you know, so it's, it just gets a bit bit annoying to be honest <laughs> which is where the rant kind of came from no that's fair and as i say i think it's it's an interesting one-on-one -on -one that's like worthwhile having as i say there's just this weird social discourse on like uh 
individual like values and, and being on your own it's really strange yeah um out yeah. of out of interest so oh sorry go on so I was just going to say it's the other thing that kind of grates on me is where people start saying, oh, you know, about starting a family. And I'm not bringing, you know, talking about, you know, the, the child issue here and whether you have children or not. But it's more, it's like I've already got a family, you know, it's, I'm not need to start a family to be in a family. You know, I have parents, I have a sister, I have brother-in-law and you know, all this. It's just like the idea of starting a family is about whether you have children or not. it's like no that's not what family is <laughs> you know family is much broader than that so that, that's the one that always annoys me as well i mean family is like a, i mean family is like what you make it you can have people who are part of your family who you don't have to be related by genetics to be family no um, also true um, yeah. you know so i think yeah that's a it's a strange one it's it's one that you know the it, there's always a um I've, I've heard it in a few different conversations but there's always a it's a, it's a when or like when are you and if you say no there's always just kind of like, oh, you'll change, you'll change your mind. It's kind of like patronizing. Oh, you'll, you'll, you'll change. It's like, no, like, why can my? This is my opinion. It's my view. I have a right to live my life as a free, independent person. Well, you know, except when society decides not. But let's, let's we'll sideball that one. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. There's just it is. There's very much an assumption that you 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 will have children. It's like, no. <laughs> Who says I should? <laughs> Yeah. I, I, you know, obviously, I can only speak for myself as a, a cisgender, yeah, real white true. presenting male, you know. But the, but even then, I I feel like I felt that as like, oh, oh well, when are you? When you when are you gonna get married? Then you gonna have kids of the two? And you know, now yeah. it's a uh, when are you gonna finish your PhD? Is the third one on top of that? <laughs> but the 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 questions are generally the same. I mean, how 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 just how annoying is that for you? <laughs> like getting those. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, when um, when I when I was married, then it was the case of you know when are you having children or you know that kind of thing. Um, I'm you know divorced now, so I'm not not married anymore. But um, yeah, it usually is now about oh when are you going to start dating again? When when are you doing this? I don't need to. <laughs> you know, I managed to forge a life where I'm actually really very happy right now and very content. And it's almost equating being in a relationship with being happy and being single with being lonely and sad. And it's like. No, actually, my experiences recently have actually been the opposite way around because actually it's been the many in my life that have made things miserable and I realise I'm a much better person when I'm on my own, actually, and I'm more content and I can do all these things I want to do and I think I'm a better friend, I'm a better daughter, I'm a better sister. So, you know, <laughs> screw that. <laughs> no, I mean, not, I mean, fair, so, you know, men... We we have issues. Well, like I cannot defend. Yeah, and I'm not generalizing. Not all men, uh, are, you know. But the ones the ones I've contact have been. I mean, you know, not not all men is a meme, but like even like as I say, as someone who is in that category, I I do sort of sit and face palm sometimes and just go, why? Like, why are we doing? This? <laughs> uh, and, and you know, again, like for the context of listeners, I'm very much raised by like the and led by the women in my life. You know, I'm. I'm privilege to uh have an incredible you know mom who's been uh, a great parent to me uh, and and work with and be inspired by many brilliant women you know um so like you know obviously people go well that's just that's what you kind of have picked up and can interpret but yeah, it is a struggle and i think again you, you you put it really eloquently there it's like why do we equate that happiness and success are linked to being in a, a relationship which is a completely arbitrary thing i mean even now uh, you know, I, I wrote quite candidly about so like my experiences dating. It's like even the way people perceive relationships and what that means is so broad and different and entangled and, and entrenched in just wildness that it's almost like not meaningless per se, but just confused. It's like you know yeah. what I mean? Like it so just the context is such like it's such an effort. I know it sound it sounds daft to reduce to this, but like it's such an effort to speak to people and to get to know someone and to like go through all that rigmarole that I just I don't blame people for being like I can't be asked. It is effortful dating. I'm just I'm bothered. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just lazy, maybe. I don't know. I don't have time for it anyway. <laughs> I don't have time for dating. <laughs> when would I be dating? I don't have time. <laughs> too busy too busy no i think but like i do just want to like really just reinforce that message of like a, you don't you don't need that type of thing i think as you you put it brilliantly yourself there um but yeah so on on that note uh which is a great note to kind of end on let's get to my favorite portion of the episode which are the quick fire questions so i always say that you're going on a an island retreat 
you're you're not being sent away you're not stranded you're just going on a retreat um mm. and you can take one film one album one book and i'd say one video game but obviously in this case i can say like another entertainment medium i maybe give okay. you another film if you'd like um okay. to, to take with you what do you take Okay, so again, I'm glad you preempted this because, <laughs> as we were saying before, I'm rubbish at thinking on my feet. So yes, so film. Um, I mean, there's lots to choose from. I, I say I'm a big film geek, but my all-time favorite film that I never get bored watching um, is Monty Python: Life of Brian. That oh, is nice. Without absolute favorite film, I I just laugh every time I see it, um, and I could watch that probably just over and over. So that would definitely be one uh, to watch uh, to take with me. Um, book, um, to be honest, with books, anything by Lee Child, any of the Jack Reacher series, um, I could read any of those probably over and over. Um, I find those very engaging and entertaining. Um, so I don't know if you can see those. I might be able to. They're on the top shelf of a bookcase, a lot of those. Um, so yes, those would be ones to take. Any kind of crime thrill is actually a, a kind of my thing. I, I really enjoy reading uh, ones um, along those lines. Um, album. Um, it took me a while to sort of, I don't think I can pinpoint one, to be honest, because as I was saying before, <laughs> my musical kind of interests are so kind of eclectic. Um, I think it would just have to be like a greatest hits of, you know, Elton John or something like that. If, you know, there, there, there'd be so many good songs on there, you know, you don't think you could ever get bored of, of listening to that. Um, uh, yeah, video game we were going to pass on because yeah, you <laughs> I can, don't you play. Can, you know, um, I, I interviewed another guest, uh, Rachel Button, who's was the previous episode, actually, and we, we swapped that for a board game, you know, so like a... If if you it would be your preference, you can take a a song book with you or something like with some lyrics in or another album or another film. Um. Okay, then. So another film. Then um, I'd probably go for Wedding Crashes. Um, I just love that film. <laughs> it's again really daft, but just really funny, really good film. Um, again, not one of the big boss, blog, blockbuster ones, but just very entertaining. So anything comedy is tends to be good. Uh, it's, it's what you know yeah. if if you didn't laugh you'd cry right you know exactly exactly and that's why i enjoy sci-fi dystopia <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> absolutely uh, i joke uh right well that that brings <laughs> me to the end of my questions i always like to do this and it's, it's a very sort of almost formal interview thing but have you got any questions you'd like to ask me before we finish yes um i do and um this is a really big question so you can answer it however you like really oh, here we go of... <laughs> um so it's about gaming about games the role in society um and i'm kind of interested to know what your take on what do you think video games can tell us about humanity oh wow do you think... okay i say it's a big question um or are there any aspects of games you think can a revealing of that or the way we engage in games or with each other in games or I just yeah what how do you think it kind of either defines us as you know in terms of humanity or what what the things are that you think it contributes or answer it however you think um I'll I'll, I'll take it straight let's just go head on you know uh, <laughs> how how video games sort of what was it impacted humanity um or tell us about humanity tell, okay. but yeah you could answer tell it us, with impact tell us about humanity I think I think they tell us actually quite a lot in the same way that um, it doesn't apply to everything because you know games exist in all standards of of quality and and loved you know from attitude. Um, but firstly, we have to kind of separate the distinction between entertainment and art. I have racked the mm -hmm. most hours in um, football games. So I love football. I miss playing football off in the offline world. So I can you know supplement that by playing a lot of it online, uh, and I enjoy it immensely. I've put hundreds of hours into various editions of Pro Evos and Fifas and Rocket League because um, it just makes me happy. Those games are not necessarily art in the same way that uh, Hellblade sends in the sacrifices or Celeste is or uh, To the Moon is, you know, uh, games that are truly artistic and have like a, this wonderfully spoken narrative and important devices. Um, so if you make that distinction, art has been something that has told us about humanity since uh, paintings on cave walls. And it has told us something about both the era we were in at the time, the imagination and the ability of people to create things that we couldn't think of. Um, you know, the genesis of what we now know as Super Mario was just Jumpman. 
at the time, and the focus of that game was actually Donkey Kong. Um, so what is what can that tell us about humanity in everything? Purely because not only do have we learned our histories through art and that sort of contextual mediums, but also video games have that extra layer of interactivity. What makes them a unique form of a unique medium compared to other media's that you actually have an impact. Most games, if you don't interact with it at all, nothing will happen. Uh, you know, the global popularity of games, you know, I think to quote my own statistics, I'm going to pretend to do that because I haven't got it up. Um, but, you know, there were millions of, of billions of pounds, millions of billions of dollars, uh, millions of players play video games all the time. There must be a reason for that. It's not because we're all just bored, you know. And I'm someone that reads books and plays games and watches TV shows and watches films. Um, so what does it tell us? It tells us that we like to have fun, that we like to play. Play is an important part of who we are. Um, to to touch on connectedness, uh, one of my you know closest friends, we've been friends for years and years. We've had game night once a week, every week for years. Um, mm-hmm. we we were online before online gaming was uh you know a thing, <laughs> before it was as big as it is now. <laughs> we would jump yeah. on a video service, we would play games online for a few hours, and I've also I have other friends where the game is very much a conduit to be, just being able to talk. I think there's an element of toxic masculinity in that, and that men just can't just have a young men can't just we can't just pick up the phone and just have a chat. That's definitely sort of feminized in popular culture, wrongly in my opinion. Why is having a conversation gendered? I don't know. Um, you know, and we we've had conversations where it's, we're we're playing a game like Rocket League or something for a few hours and having a couple of drinks, but it's more about that conversation um it yeah it just is a background noise it's a it's ephemeral to the actual conversation that we're having um lastly you know i think there are these vast communities and worlds and i'd even go as far as say universes that are built on games games provide experiences that people can't otherwise have you know as a person with albinism as a person who is partially sighted legally blind whatever terminology you want to use um i'm never gonna get to drive a car i might be able to get a driverless car but i can i can smash a few courses on my car I can jump on on GTA and drive around these fictional places. That's not an experience I could have otherwise. Um, yeah, I realize I'm, I'm going on quite a lot here, but uh, you know, so what does it tell us? I think everything and nothing at the same time because people be the same but different. Um, that's my experience. That's what I take from games. You know, it, a lot of the time it is mostly fun, and then sometimes I want to feel things. <laughs> you know, um, RPGs are my favorite genre. What does it tell you about someone that's willing to sit and do? repeated random battles for several hours just to get some slightly higher numbers on a screen that make things maybe slightly easier or slightly more fun you know yeah. the the psychology of grinding is something i would love to look into <laughs> like as a big rpg fan why do we do it what's the point um and this is someone again that to add that extra layer of it i've watched like youtube videos of like one of my favorite streamers uh, death unites is a big fan of fantasy 7 player i've watched him just sit and grind four hours on youtube not even interactively on twitch just while he's just chatting along to people in chat doing it that I, i'm not even getting any benefit of the grind you know so what does it tell us about humanity anything and everything and i think the way we interpret that and you know the way people are researching it is very important you need to do that in the right way in a scientifically rigorous and fair way and an honest and transparent way um, and you know, if only someone were like looking into, you know, I don't know, say potential positive effects of games and how they might be, people might be receptive to messages, like say around a really important social topic, like I don't know, mental health. I don't know if someone's not working on that, they should be. Oh wait, uh, <laughs> that me. Um, there's this big scope for that because if if you can, if you've ever, you know, you're a film buff, if you've ever felt an emotion from watching a film, good or bad, having a laugh, or left the film going, wow, that spoke to me. I've had that transformative experience many times playing games, and particularly when I've played the types of games that I'm researching. What does this do to players? And there's next to no research on it, like at all, you know. And even even just I think there's a, a general, to my knowledge, and it's not it's not an extensive knowledge, but like just a lack of like, well, what do people get from playing? What do people actually take from it? You know, there's a lot around like player motivations, and and now Nick Yee, there's the um, oh I forget the name of it, but the player motivations profile uh, and that's like a fun little questionnaire you can do you know and that tells you like a little like maybe what you're interested in it's quite reflexive it's self-report there are methodological challenges about that and it's how you feel at the time maybe it doesn't reflect you all the time and all things like this um but 
it it wouldn't be what it is if people didn't enjoy it and it didn't bring people together as much as it does. I mean, just yesterday, again at the time of recording, I went to see the Final Fantasy VII Remake uh, Orchestra live in the Royal Albert Hall. And oh, wow. that was a collection of people from all around the world, um, from all different backgrounds, ethnicities, and, and universes themselves. They came together to enjoy the music of a game performed by a live orchestra and choir. You know, and it was a phenomenal experience. And if that doesn't give you a slight insight as to what video games can do, when even a game isn't present, I, w- I was very emotional. I was very, like, you know, I was nearly in tears at a certain point. Such was the quality and the, uh, and, you know, relation of the music to the to the in-game events and images that I that I had a, a, an emotional reaction to it. So, to, you know, in conclusion, at the end of this essay, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, what can video games tell us about humanity? Anything, everything, and probably nothing, because it'll probably be studied long. <laughs> That was such an epic answer. That that went above and beyond. <laughs> I mean, if I was giving that a mark, that would be like first class. First class. Yeah. I didn't you, know you You say that, but I'd have been it. 2,000 words over the word count and I'd have had to cut loads of it out and then it would have made it like a, a, a 50. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing there is about the transformative things and the connection things. Those seem to be the, the key key themes that kind of come out of that and... That makes a lot of sense. That was such a good answer. Thank you very much for I, <laughs> your insight there. That was so wonderful. Heavily biased. I've I've been playing games since I was like three years old. You know, since I could hold yeah. a controller. Yeah. Uh, and you know, if I was gonna like unpack that more, I don't know. Do I have a big attachment to games because when I was small, I didn't enjoy playing outside because I didn't like other children. They didn't like me. I didn't also like the sun. Personal albinism probs, lol. Uh, so I I went inward to play games where I could experience these vast universes. You know, like yeah. yeah, you could you could say I'm being overly uh, positive and familial with games because they resonate with me on that level. That's a fair fair critique. I'm aware of that as a criticism. I'm aware of my own biases, but ultimately, if if you again make that distinction between entertainment and art, art have, has always told us stuff about people and societies and the cultures at the time, yeah, rightly or wrongly. It, yeah. it exposes the good and the bad. You know, there's some there's some very bad games, and I mean games that touch on very bad things in a very mm-hmm. poor way. And in, in, you know, games exist yeah. like that. Um, but that tells us something about the society and the culture at the time. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really important distinction. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. That that was arguably the most in, intensive question I've been asked. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I knew, I knew you'd have some really interesting insights, and you articulated them so well. If that was me thinking on my feet, I'd be like, uh, um, 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 but it just, it was just some kind, like some kind of, I don't know, it almost looked rehearsed, and it's not. I can guarantee you I'd not sent this Chris this question in advance. So if if you, uh, I I'm tentative to reveal this because obviously you are technically my uh, primary supervisor, but I am I am gifted with the ability to just to bull crap. Uh, to just let let the the oh, brain the have. brain just goes and the words come out and because I've read a few books it sounds very intelligent and very articulate. It's, uh, it's, it's not a bad skill to have, to be honest. In actual fact, <laughs> the inside of my brain was just a chow a cow chewing grass. Uh, just going like, oh, uh, okay. And oh yeah. There you go. You got an answer. So. No, it's, it was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right, that about wraps up this episode. I say episode. I mean we've. This I may well split this in two for your convenience. So there'll there'll be intros and outros spreaded throughout this, but don't worry about that. That's a that's a that's a post production issue. We'll sort that. Um Thanks. so all that remains for me to say is Linda, thank you so much for coming on. You've been a wonderful guest. It's been a really, really enjoyable. Thank you chat. for inviting me. It's um, been wonderful to have that. Thank you. I have very much been psyched to be with you. And I, I will again also just to just let's keep some more flattery on it. I was incredibly <laughs> excited to be working with you from the off, even even um, before my PhD application had even been approved or put in. I was emailing Linda and said, would you be interested in working on this? Would you be willing to help me with the application? Because God knows I'm awful at it. Uh, <laughs> and you were, you were nice enough to do that. And then here we are working together now on this, on this my PhD quest, as I like to call it. Um, Indeed. But yeah, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, all that remains now is to go over uh, to our visual final scene and say goodbye. So thank you everyone for listening. Hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll see you again soon. Until then, take care of yourselves.
and goodbye. Bye, thank you.